Welcome everyone, today in Rich and Spiritual, presents My Search for Truth, Volume 3 by Henry Thomas Hamblin. Chapter 1, Imagination Perhaps my readers may wonder what I used to teach in the early days, and why it was helpful to some. Here then is one aspect of my work which it may not be out of place to mention. I discovered that, to a large extent, man creates the conditions of his life through his imagination. In one of my early books, I wrote, you are the architect of your own life. It is yours to make or to mar. By the power of thought you are building. Are you building a right? This statement was true as far as it went, for we as well as our environment are the products of our thoughts, but thoughts are powerful because of what they do, not because of what they are in themselves. It is because they awaken and direct the imagination that they are so powerful, in their effect upon our life and circumstances. That great mystic Jacob Bohm whose teaching is so difficult that few can understand anything of it, confirms this. Although his writings are so deep and even obscure, he makes one thing very clear, which is that it is our wayward imagination which is the cause of our present hellish conditions, and that things can be put right only to the extent that our imagination is brought into correspondence with the all-wise imagination. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 7, 9 What all this means is that our imagination has fallen away from the all-wise imagination and has created disorderly and even hellish conditions, for mind is creative, thought rules all. Thought rules all because it affects our creative imagination, consequently as we think so we are and so do we become, and so does our environment become. The invitation is that we should return to the one creative source of all perfection, thus forsaking our wrong thoughts and imagination, and so think God's thoughts instead, consequently bringing our wayward imagination into unison with the all-wise imagination, which can create only perfection. Prayer is an attempt to bring our mind and imagination into correspondence with infinite mind and the all-wise imagination. We do not pray in order to alter God or change His purpose. The sole object of prayer is to bring ourselves back to the likeness and image of Elohim in which we were created. What is man, that thou art mindful of him? For thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim. Elohim, according to Genesis I, was the creator or creators of the world. Scholars tell us that Elohim is a plural word, consequently we read, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Such being the case, it is difficult to understand why the old hymn writers described themselves as worms. It would have been better I think if they had described themselves as caterpillars, for they, after passing through the chrysalid stage, turn into butterflies, whereas worms always remain worms. But what a lovely hymn the old writers could have written about the caterpillar. First, a poor creeping thing, next, a chrysalid, corresponding to the hymnist's long sleep in the grave, then after that the resurrection that, I feel would have been a much better theme. But the Bible does not teach that we are worms in spite of what Bildad the Shuhite, and also David, may have said. It tells us that we are created in the image and likeness of our Creator. In the teaching of Jesus we see that we have departed from the all-wise imagination, and have created hell for ourselves through the misuse of our imagination, and that the only remedy is to get back to that which is forever true, viz. God's idea concerning each one of us. This outer man is not the real man, also this outer world is not the true world, both are falsities. 
What we need to do then is to get back to God's idea concerning both the true man and the true world. Prayer is an attempt to bring our wayward thought and imagination into correspondence with God's thought and imagination. We pray in order that we may see things as they really are, not as they falsely appear, in other words, what we seek is to know the truth, after which the truth will make us free, even as was promised by Jesus. Paradoxically, however, we have to seek truth for its own sake, and not in order to win the reward of freedom. If we persevere with our attempts by means of prayer to think God's thoughts after him, a time comes when we experience a sense of great peace, we feel completely at home in God and in a state of great harmony. This is due to the fact that our mind has begun to function in correspondence with the mind of God. When we see the thing which may be troubling us, as it is in the mind of God, then our mind is thinking in the same way that God's mind thinks. If ye abide in my word, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus Jesus taught the gospel of the kingdom, he told those about him that the kingdom of heaven was nigh, he spoke of the kingdom and of heavenly things. He said that if his hearers would abide in his teachings, that is, to think of God in his perfect order, they would be made free. The moment we really know, when we actually realize the truth, we become free. I wish I could describe this experience, but it is not possible to do so. Truth is always present with us, although we may not be able to realize it. That we cannot realize it does not alter the fact that it is always with us, awaiting the time when our mind and imagination cease their errancy and become attuned to the mind and imagination of God. It may be asked how I could have taught this, seeing that, generally speaking, practically no one can realize the truth, whilst those who could do so would not be taking any instruction from me? How could I exhort my students to realize truth, seeing that they had no idea what truth is? I used to tell them that until they could realize truth themselves, they should accept the testimony of those who have realized it. I told them that man, in very truth, is a celestial being, belonging to celestial realms. My great desire was, and still is, that they might realize their true identity and might know that in their true inwardness they are sons of God, true children of eternity, and one with that which changeth not. The beloved John expressed the same truth when he said, Beloved now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear, it is not yet apparent, what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, that is, identical with him. I told them that in their true inwardness no real harm could ever come to them, for the real self in them was a spark from the sacred flame, deathless, diseaseless and eternal. Worlds might be born, and worlds might flourish and pass away, and even the whole universe be rolled up like a scroll, but they in their true inwardness would always remain beyond time and unaffected by change, because they were one with, identical to, the eternal. I used to suggest that they should say, Man is a spiritual being living in a spiritual universe, governed by spiritual laws, and upheld by spiritual powers. And by spiritual I really meant celestial, which is the highest realm of all to which man in his true inwardness, as a son of God, eternally belongs. By, man, I meant of course not the outward man, who is, of the earth, earthy, and full of frailties, but the real inward man, the image and likeness of Elohim, who in most people is so effectively covered up that it is difficult to believe that he is present at all. By realizing the truth about man, we learn to realize the truth about ourselves. We discover that we are not this body, nor this mind, nor this soul, nor even this spirit, for we can speak to them all and command them. No, we are something far greater than any or all of these. What we truly are can no more be defined than God can be defined. When we reach this point we are not far from what Jesus called the kingdom. 
Of course the beginner wants to ask how he can know God, without knowing something about him. If God is undefinable, he asks, how can he ever know him, how can man ever know the undefinable? This is a deep question, and I do not think that I ever dealt with it adequately in those early days. It is true that it is impossible to define God who is the undefinable, for the God whom we define, or try to express in words, is not the transcendent one. We limit God directly we try to define him, for by so doing we bring him within the limitations of the human mind. Our God whom we define is really only man's idea of God. Another deep thought is that our highest ideas about God are really only a sort of preview of what we shall ultimately attain to. But of course we can know the unknowable, but not by the human and finite mind. God, who transcends man's intellect, can only be known by that divine something in man which also transcends his intellect, and also cannot be defined. In other words, only God can know God. However, this was too deep a matter to broach to beginners, so I did not mention it, in fact I did just the reverse, for I taught them to meditate upon what are called the attributes of God, wholeness, perfection, justice, and so on. They did not know that they were meditating upon the attributes of their real interior self, and that as they meditated their false ego or self, the enemy of their souls, was being liquidated. He, the true or Christ in you self, must increase, but I, the false self, must decrease. It was also suggested that students should make use of their imagination by trying to see good everywhere, and also beauty. Instead of seeing other people as they appear to be, they were to try to see the real man who is hidden within. To do so is not a new idea by any means, for it was Calvin who said that we should not look at the imperfect outward man, but rather that we should try to see the divine image hidden within the man. I did not know anything about Calvin then, except the unfortunate doctrine named after him, and it was many years before I came across this statement from him. It was good to have what I was teaching confirmed by so great a theologian, the fact that I possessed no learning and consequently had to rely upon intuition made it the more interesting to find, that what I bad been teaching was the same, as one of the great and learned men of the past had taught. Trying to see into people and into things in order to find their hidden perfection trains the imagination along heavenly lines, for by so doing we are trying to see things as they really, are in the real world of perfect everything, and perfect order and absolute rightness. I suggested to our students that they should spend a certain amount of time every day in using and training their creative imagination in a special way. I suggested that they should close their eyes and think of a perfect heavenly state, in which were order, wholeness and completeness. Instead of disease, sickness, pain, suffering, they should imagine a state of health, wholeness, and fullness of life, instead of poverty and anxiety, they should form a mental concept, but not visualize, a condition of instant and ever-present abundance, every need being supplied fully and completely just as it arises. And so with all the many negative concepts of the mind, discord, failure, sickness, their opposites should be imagined. The intellect can do little in this field. But the imagination combined with feeling is capable, of bringing about changes in our body, and affairs such as are beyond the wit and wisdom of man to explain. I must confess that in the very early days of my work, I suggested that people should visualize what they wanted. This of course was all wrong, and as soon as possible I gave it up. It is wrong to do so because it is using the human mind to attempt to force life to produce conditions according to our pattern, whereas of course our greatest good can come to us only through our life being lived according to the divine pattern. Therefore when we use our creative imagination we should not try to enforce our pattern on life, but should be willing to accept whatever form God's answer may take. Thus if we are poor, we should not envisage ourselves as being rich in worldly goods, 
but should try to realize that we have entered into the glorious liberty of the children of God, and set free from every limitation. It is not sufficient for us to use affirmations, but in addition we must enter into a realization of the truth that we have affirmed. Many of us I am afraid are inclined to become slack when times are prosperous and easy with us, then when difficulties arise and troubles sweep down on us, we are not able to realize the truth which makes us free. This is a great error but alas, we are prone to fall into it. What we should do is to make the most of our opportunity when the sky of our life is clear. When beset by troubles it is not easy to realize truth, we have to work through the darkness before we can do so. But when our sky is clear, and the barometer of our life is at, set fair, then is the time to realize truth for to do so is easy, and each time that we do so we make it easier for us to meet our next difficulty or test. There are times when we feel unusually peaceful and at one with the whole universe, a lovely view, or even smoke belching out from a factory chimney stack, may appear unusually beautiful. At such times heaven is very near to us, and we should make the most of it. Then it is easy to realize our oneness with the whole, we feel perfectly at home in God, in our right place, in right relationship with everything, and everyone else, all included in one complete and perfect whole. Chapter 2 on trying to enter the silence. For many years I tried to enter the silence but in vain. I often read about it, but could not find it, for one thing, no two writers seemed to agree as to what the silence was. Some seemed to think that it was a kind of trance, others taught that it was simply inhibiting all thought, thus making the mind a blank, yet others again said that it was a state of negative passivity, or a sinking down into a state of dreamy self-hypnotism. None of these methods would bear examination. First of all, falling into trances is at any rate, undesirable for us Westerners. I cannot see how it can fit us for the battle of life. Trances, visions and the like are psychic and although they are mentioned in the Bible, and were indulged in by some of the saints, I am quite sure that, speaking personally, I am better without them. The wisest of the Christian mystics confirm this view, by stating that in most cases these phenomena are hindrances rather than helps. Most of us will remember that Christian, and his companion in Pilgrim's progress when traveling the heavenly road were attracted, by what appeared to be a much pleasanter path, that of Bypath Meadow. Instead of pursuing their hard and toilsome journey along the King's Highway, how much pleasanter and easier it would appear to be to get over the stile and walk in the cool and delightful bypath meadow. So off the two of them went along this new and interesting way, but alas, because it led them away from the true path, they soon met with trouble and finally into doubt and despair. In the same way the wise saints and mystics warn us against being attracted by visions and trance experiences. They are not necessarily a sign of divine favor, but may be a hindrance in that they may distract our attention away from God. This is the object of the adversary to get our attention away from our divine center, and to direct it to something which flatters but keeps us away from God, instead of bringing us nearer. If therefore we find that we have a gift for visions, trances and so on, we should not fall into the error of thinking that we are especially favored by God but rather we should look upon them as something to be transcended as soon as possible, even if we cannot avoid them altogether. There are exceptions of course and we must not criticize, still less condemn, those who have derived comfort from a psychic experience, but rather give thanks to God that they have been blessed in the way they have. My father for all his orthodoxy declared that when he was converted he saw the Lord Jesus as plainly as ever he had seen anybody in his life. He said that it was not a spirit that he saw, but that Jesus was as real and solid as any man could be and that he turned and looked at him, a look which captured my father's heart for all time. Then again after our mother died, father saw her in a similar way. 
Experiences of this kind are helpful to those who need such consolation, and who are so constituted that they can be helped and comforted by them. Then again inhibiting in thought, which means making the mind a blank, is a dangerous practice for it invites possession. Instead of emptying the mind, we should fill it with thoughts of God. Then no evil can come into it, whereas, if we try to keep it empty, the most evil thoughts may enter and become a fixed obsession. The other idea of making oneself passively negative is equally dangerous and to do so would be to invite mediumship. We should at all times keep our mind positive and directed towards God. Being positive makes for integration, being negative produces disintegration. When we sink down into a state of negative passivity, we vibrate in correspondence with Hades, but when we rise up into a positive state of realization, we vibrate in correspondence with celestial realms. We need to go up and up until the vibrations are so rapid that we reach a state of stillness. When we turn a wheel slowly we can see all the spokes moving, but when we turn it rapidly the spokes disappear from our sight. So is it with the silence, we get beyond all conflict and all thought, until we reach that which is beyond thought, in the great stillness. It is a state of rest, in the same way that the heavenly bodies pursue a course of great activity and are themselves masses of activity, yet they are in a state of poise, balance, and ease, resting easily, each in its appointed place, without effort or strain. I tried many and various ideas and suggested methods, mostly without success. My search was a difficult, even dangerous, one for I was quite alone and had no one to advise me. Also, the right kind of books never seemed to come my way I know now that there was a reason for this, it was necessary for me to travel the hard and solitary way, in order that I should know what I know through experience and thus be able to speak with conviction. Yet no matter how much I tried, I could not find the silence, until all at once I realized that it was my trying so hard that was hindering me, and that if I would cease my efforts, then I should find that already I was in the silence. It was then realized that the silence is always with us, and only needs recognition, it is not something that has to be created. What we have to do is to stop our fruitless strivings, and instead rest in the love of God, which supports us in much the same way that the earth appears to be supported in its atmosphere. Whilst I am strongly against regulating respiration and retaining the breath, yet I believe that possessing the ability to breathe deeply and fully has been a help to me. When I was young, I breathed through my mouth shallowly, and I can recall my mother telling me on every possible occasion to close my mouth, and to breathe through my nose. Through this bad habit my nostrils had become narrow and almost closed, so that I could not breathe through the nose properly. This went on for years, until I became interested in physical culture. Then I started in earnest to try to breathe deeply through my nose. The first thing that I had to do was to enlarge my nostrils, so I practiced distending them. I had to do this mentally, of course, in much the same way that it is possible to send blood to any part of the body by the power and use of thought. This I did to such good effect that I developed muscles like those of a professional singer, and also my breath control was almost as perfect as theirs. I could never see quite what use this was going to be to me, but now I believe that this development has been a help to me as regards entering the silence. Of course nowadays I do not do any deep breathing consciously, but when I think of God and divine things then deep breathing in tune with the inner life of the spirit comes to me of its own volition. I also think that this development, this capacity for very deep physical breathing, may have had something to do with the interior respiration which has come to me of recent years. But of this, more anon. Nervous tautness had always been one of my difficulties. I did not know how to relax and when I was interested in anything I held my breath, hardly breathing at all, consequently I found it difficult to do deep waistline breathing and yet remain relaxed at the same time. 
But practice makes perfect and in course of time I found that my breathing, when I allowed it to be free, took on a rhythm and a quality all its own, and that I did not control it, but that it was working in harmony with the rhythm of the hidden life. However, that did not happen all at once, indeed it came only after many years. As I have said, the first sign I had of any success in trying to enter the silence was when I woke up to the fact that I was already in the silence, and that I only hindered my progress by my constant trying. I was like a person learning to swim who, after many struggles to keep afloat, suddenly discovers that the water will support him if he will but lean on it and cease his frantic and jerky efforts. As soon as he trusts the water and rests on it, his hitherto taut body relaxes and becomes supple. I found that it was much the same with my attempts to enter the silence. I had hitherto strained and struggled in a state of tautness, which was the very thing which kept me from entering, yet, paradoxically enough, I should never have found the silence if I had not made such efforts. Another hindrance was that at first I left out devotion, and also did not realize the value and necessity of humbleness. I found that I got on better when I followed the path the saints have trod. They knelt in adoration, and no doubt turned their eyes upwards. I did not always kneel in a literal sense, but mentally and metaphorically I cast myself at the feet of the Lord, but turned my physical eyes upwards, with lids closed, as though looking up to his face. Jacob Bohm says, Steadfastly fix thine inner eye upon one point, and by faith press into this inmost cell within thee. I am sure this is good practice, indeed I follow this method very often to start with, then after a time I look upward and am all the better prepared to do so, because of the preliminary looking within to the region of the heart. In the Hindu philosophy we are told that there are three paths of attainment, Karma Marga, or the path of good works, Bhakti Marga, or the path of devotion and Jnana Marga, or the path of knowledge. The second path seems, predominantly, to be the one which I am following, although we have to follow all three paths simultaneously. Yet it is generally admitted, so I believe, that Bhakti Marga is not only the easiest but the simplest and most direct path of all. All that we have to do is to love and adore. Because God is love, it is only natural that it should be so. Love is the key to every situation in life. Although he did not so classify them, Jesus taught the three paths of attainment, first, the path of good works, as given in the Sermon on the Mount, and elsewhere, second, the path of love and devotion, if ye love me, keep my commandments. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, third, the path of understanding. If ye continue in my words, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In the teaching of Jesus we have all that we need, but it is interesting and helpful to make a slight study of comparative religions, not in order to try to prove that any one religion is superior to all others, but rather to see how wonderfully all religions in their deepest implications agree, and how they all meet finally at the same one goal of divine union. Let me however return to my subject. It is useless trying to enter the silence, if we have any unconfessed sin on our conscience, neither can we even begin to approach the entrance to the silence, if we bear any resentment towards anyone whatsoever, or have done him a wrong. Therefore if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. It is useless to try to enter the great stillness which is the presence of God realized, if we are possessed by the angry devils of resentment. We must first get rid of these disturbing influences if we would enter into the central harmony. Also, if we have wronged our brother we must put the matter right, because we must not try to enter the Holy Presence with the guilt of our action resting upon us. And if wrong has been done to us, we must forgive freely and become filled with thoughts, 
and feelings of goodwill. What is termed, entering the silence, is really becoming attuned to the Divine Presence, which means that our vibrations have to be raised to a higher, pitch until they vibrate in harmony with the Divine pitch or note. In the Hindu philosophy we are told that the Divine note sounding through the universe is Aum or Om. If this is intoned with the lips closed, the whole of the head vibrates accordingly. I do not use it myself, but I can quite understand that our brothers in India find it helpful in meditation, or in preparing for meditation. One of the results achieved by religious exercises, and practices is to change the vibrations of the whole body so that a process of transmutation takes place, every cell is affected, so that the body becomes less dead-looking and more translucent, to the extent that it becomes filled with the divine light. When first I heard one from the East intoning Aum, I was at once struck by its similarity to our Western intoning, particularly the word, Amen. I found upon trying it that it came quite natural to me to intone both Aum and our liturgical prayers, it was the same note and produced the same vibration. I have never pursued the matter, but I think now that I ought to have done so for I think that it would help and perhaps expedite the process of transmutation. St. Paul, quoting Ferrer Fenton's translation, says. But our policy consists in possessing an object in heaven, from where also we expect a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humility, making it like the body of His Majesty, by the internal working of His power, and He will subject all to Himself. Philippians 3, 20, 1. From this we see that St. Paul taught that through contemplation, the same power of the eternal Logos which raised up Jesus from the dead, and transmuted his earthly body into an immortal body of eternal light substance, the vibrations of which could be changed at will would also transmute our material body, and make it the same as the body in which the Lord Jesus ascended. Some teachers demand that on sitting down to enter the silence we should adopt a right posture, hold our hands in a special manner and breathe in a certain way. But in my experience this has not been found to be the case, instead I discovered that, as usual, love is the key. If we approach God with love in our heart towards Him, and with love in our heart to all mankind then, as Jesus said, we are not far from the kingdom. Love is indeed the key. We may possess all the technique that was ever conceived by the mind of man, but if we have not love, all our efforts to enter the silence will be in vain. The silence is the presence of God realized, therefore if we would enter it we must be attuned to the presence of God who is love. Love is ever the key. We might intone to further orders, but if our heart were not right, it would be all in vain. Chapter 3, The Law of Plenty I firmly believe that there is a law of plenty. As we gaze at the prodigality of nature we cannot fail to be impressed by this fact. Nature is indeed most bountiful. Wherever we go we see how great that fullness is except, of course, where man has exploited the earth and turned it into a waste and a desert. But that is not the earth's fault, or nature's, but it is the result of man's selfish exploitation. Deserts are on the march. Why? Simply because of selfish, ignorant, and wicked exploitation on the part of man. The very forces which are causing the deserts to invade the cultivatable land are the same forces which, if they had not been thrown out of balance, would have maintained the earth in fullness and abundance. The law of life is balance. If we put back into the soil as much as we take out nature will nourish us abundantly, but if we try to cheat her, by taking out more than we put in, then we upset the balance of life. As a result, the forces and powers of nature become inverted and work against us instead of for us, as they were designed to do. From this we see that the laws of life are designed to give us unlimited plenty, far beyond our needs, and that if they were obeyed, there would be more than enough for all. 
Where wise and just methods obtain, there is no lack, for the earth then becomes a transformer of solar energy so that the solar energy is changed by the earth into growth. This we take and use and then if, afterwards, we put the whole of the residue back into the soil, the cycle is completed. The earth is neither robbed nor exploited, but continues to be as fruitful as ever. We thus see that the divine idea is one of plenty through the amazing prodigality of nature. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When I was young I was enterprising, but always ground down by poverty and lack. By great struggle I managed to start my own business, but my customers all appeared to be poverty-minded. Their main idea seemed to be to beat me down as low as possible, so that they could benefit at my expense. I did not know then that I attracted this, thrifty, type of client because of my own poverty complex. I had been born into a remarkably thrifty home where we never knew the comparative plenty such as was enjoyed in, artisans, homes and whose standard of life was almost extravagant compared with ours. This ultra-frugality and system of the most rigid economy, in which I was brought up made such an impression upon my young mind, that I do not think I have ever completely recovered from it. Its good effect has been that I have never wasted anything, its bad effect has been that I have had great difficulty in spending money for myself on even the necessary things of life. As I say, I attracted the acquisitive thrifty type of client, whilst I on my part was prepared to give the best service possible, and I did give it without stint. But still there was always a miserable response. Of course, the cause of my difficulty was that I possessed a penny mind, I was concerned with the cutting down of expenses, with saving a penny here, and tuppence there, and so on. I did not know at the time that such thinking was conditioning my circumstances. However, although I had a penny mind, I was, strangely enough, daring and enterprising. Consequently I looked out for suitable premises in the best and most expensive part of the town. It was while inspecting certain business premises which later I was able to rent on a favorable lease, that I had a curious experience. I, the poor struggling young man with a poverty complex, suddenly had a strange feeling that the air all round me was filled with golden sovereigns. The air seemed to be crammed with them, just like snowflakes in a snowstorm. I suddenly realized that there was unlimited substance or wealth which could be mined by anyone who had sufficient energy, faith and enterprise. I realized also that life was not the poverty-stricken thing that I had imagined it to be. This was far from being a full understanding of the truth about the law of plenty, but it was an important step in the right direction. After that experience I found that most people were not as cheese-pairing and close-fisted, as I had thought them to be and I also had more clients than ever before. My previous attitude of mind had not only invested my clients with my own meanness and ultra-frugality, but also had kept many more generous people away. But it was many years before I began to realize, that there is an inner realm of sufficiency which desires to supply all our needs. Jesus said that we were not to be anxious about our food and drink, our clothing and other necessaries of life, but that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then, if we did so, all the necessary things of life would be added, without anxiety. Such an injunction seems to be pure foolishness to most people, but then, so do all the other injunctions given to us by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The wisdom of God appears to be foolishness to the carnal or material mind. The sayings of Jesus, alas, receive scant attention today, but we ignore his teachings at our peril. Experience has taught me that there is an inward source of supply, and that this is the presence of God. In the ordinary way we ignore this inward source, therefore it cannot operate in our life and affairs, consequently we have to live in the same way as people of the world, fighting, struggling, grasping, or else be like dumb, driven cattle. Then when we reach a certain age, 
we are discarded. The trouble with most people, once said an American humorist, is that they have no invisible means of support. When outward means fail, such people are helpless, for they do not know how to tap their inner resources. In the day of adversity their fortunes crumble away because they have no roots in God, the inexhaustible substance, in which everything has its origin and source. The worst of it is that the more fiercely adversity hits us, and the more we are pushed about by life, the more difficult it becomes to find time for meditation and private, personal prayer. Those who have been through such an experience will know what I mean. At such times one seems to be caught up in a huge net, and the more one struggles, the more enmeshed one becomes. Also one seems to be in a vicious circle, so that all that one does only makes things worse. Everything is wrongly timed and comes to pass at the exact moment when we are caught on the wrong foot. The only remedy, so I have found when passing through a difficult time, is to find God's inward peace and enter into a state of inner harmony, oneness and unity, at the same time being as patient as we can in our trying circumstances, doing our work as well as we know how, looking to God to bring about a divine adjustment in His own way and at His own time. That, in a nutshell, is the method which I have been led to employ, and which God has graciously blessed on many occasions. I have known some people, however, who tried to restore their shattered fortunes by, get rich quick, methods, which promised a rapid and large return for little work, and small capital outlay. Because such schemes were not based on service but were launched to benefit themselves and not the public, such activities failed. I cannot remember a single one which turned out a success. The only remedy is through work, patience and acceptance in the outer life, and a unity and oneness with our divine source in the inner life. Work on the outer plane by itself is not enough, it leads to exhaustion, and perhaps a breakdown. Work, too, on the inner plane alone is not sufficient. Both are necessary, so also is patience. When the inner rhythm of our life is broken, or has been upset, it takes time for it to be restored. Consequently we have to be patient. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring, it, to pass. In every life there come times of drought and adversity. There is a process of going forward and returning, there is an ebb and a flow of the tide of life. We have to be patient while the tide is running out, and must be content to wait until the tide turns in our favor. Then when we move forward we are carried along on the crest, of the wave to victory and achievement. I have on occasion made losses, and have wasted a lot of work and energy, strength and health in a vain effort to force things, when times have been unpropitious. Being of an impetuous nature, I have rushed on when I ought to have waited. Not being content to await God's time, I have tried to make everything conform to my time. The results have always been disastrous. We have to keep to God's time and keep in step with God, if we are to express in our outward life even a shadow or outline of the inner perfection which, is God's idea or pattern of what our life should be. What puzzles beginners and those who are not accustomed to philosophic thought, is that everything is and yet is not, at one and the same time. For instance, the mystic and the metaphysician may say, There is no evil yet at the same time they readily admit that evil is all around them. The explanation is that they are affirming what is true of the inner reality and the mind of God. There is no evil in the mind of God, nor in his archetypal ideas. These are permanent and eternal, and form part of reality. They are absolute perfection. But these perfect ideas, when expressed in the outer life, lose their perfection. That which is a perfect whole in essence, becomes thrown out of balance, so that what is good when it forms part of a perfect whole, 
with everything in its right place, at the right time, becomes disorderly and what we call evil. Consequently the mystic, having contemplated the reality in all its beauty, wholeness and completeness, and also the metaphysician, who has argued and reasoned himself into a realization of absolute truth, can both declare that there is no evil, and yet be surrounded by very obvious evil. There are two sides to everything. It has been said that there are two sides to the shield of truth, the outer is what man in his ignorance sees, the inner is what God sees. God who is perfection absolute can create and see only perfection. We see this truth even in our human relationships. To the pure all things are pure. God, who is infinite and absolute goodness, perfection, life, health, wholeness, completeness, can see only these and other virtues in his creations, for he can see only himself reflected in what he creates. Therefore, on the inside, there is only perfection. It is only on the outside where an inversion has taken place, that imperfection is to be seen. Because God, as the Absolute, can see no evil but only the perfection which is his own reflection, some anxious souls think that they and also their troubles and sufferings are unknown to God, and so have been discouraged. But God has other aspects. Where God in his absoluteness cannot enter, God as love can come even into our most secret griefs, losses and sorrows. Love manifests as Jesus, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. There is no trouble or failure of ours into which love cannot come. God, in his absolute aspect, cannot see poverty. It does not exist in his mind. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But the invitation is for man the unrighteous to forsake his thoughts and his ungodlike ways, and to return to the Lord. The law of being is plenty, not poverty. God, who is infinite and inexhaustible substance, creates in profusion, regardless of cost, so to speak. There is a spiritual basis from which plenty flows. In the inner world of perfection thought becomes clothed with substance, instantly, in the outer life on this material plane it takes longer, but the process is much the same. Matter is simply electricity, and thought also is electric force. This may explain why a man with a poverty type of mind, finds himself in poverty-stricken surroundings, or at any rate, never attains to a state of freedom, while another one whose mind is quite different, may start with nothing and yet in a comparatively short time become surrounded, with everything that he needs. Ordinary thinking will not achieve such a metamorphosis. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Saith the Lord. Human thought of lack and limitation must give place to truth, or God thought, of infinite and inexhaustible abundance. It makes a tremendous difference to our lives, if we can make such a change, even though it be only partial in extent. The great secret is in recognizing that all good things come from God, and not from man, or as a result of our own effort and toil and strain. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We who are the sons of God may draw freely from the invisible and inexhaustible resources of God. We possess invisible means of support. We do not need great possessions, for all our needs are supplied, out of his riches in glory. Because God's resources are infinite, our resources also are infinite. We must not judge by appearances. If Jesus had judged by appearances when the people were hungry, they would never have been fed. Jesus refused to be restricted by the apparent limitations of five barley loaves and two small fishes, but drew upon the inexhaustible resources of infinite substance. In the same way, if we allow ourselves to be overawed by appearances of lack, 
forgetting that we are sons of God and joint heirs with Christ, of all the resources of God, then we make it very difficult for ourselves to manifest the same abundance which Jesus did. I admit that it is far from easy to trust in God's invisible resources when we are confronted by arrears of rent, large bills to be paid, an overdrawn account at the bank, and a mortgaged life policy, to say nothing of a completely empty purse. Many readers would say that to ask anyone in such circumstances to trust, in God would be demanding too much of any man. Well, I would never ask anyone to do what I would not do myself, or what I have not done myself. I have had to face such experiences myself, and of course I did not find them easy, but each time I was brought through. Each time that I considered my financial position I felt a thrill of fear go through me. But, somehow or other, I managed to maintain my faith. Of course, it would have been far less difficult for me if I could have lived in the consciousness of divine supply, but I had not then reached that stage. Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What did he mean by this? I suppose that I have heard thousands of sermons but I have never listened to one which explained what Jesus actually meant by this statement. What did Jesus mean by the kingdom of God? He meant conscious union with God. What did Jesus mean by his righteousness? He meant God's divine order. Therefore logically paraphrase the words of Jesus into, but seek first a state of union with God's consciousness of abundant perfection and completeness, for if you do this inwardly, then outwardly you will have all your material needs supplied. Having been brought up and trained in a consciousness of lack and limitation, I naturally found it very difficult to change over to a consciousness of abundance and plenty. I had been brought up in the idea that we live in an unfriendly universe, and that everything is against us. Also that we have to chase after things, and hold tight onto them otherwise they would slip from our grasp. And all the time that I remained in that consciousness things eluded me. When I thought that I had them within my grasp they slipped away from me. I had also been nurtured in the idea that we are separate from God. Consequently my life suffered in much the same way as that of the prodigal son. He left his father's home, state of union, and went into a far country, state of apparent separateness, the consequence being that he hungered, and fed on pig's swill. And no man gave to him. Then, when he returned home, to a state of unity with his divine source, he experienced plenty and abundance. Life, of course, is not for feasting and gluttony, life also is not meant to be austere and severely ascetic. The middle path, so I have found, is always the path of wisdom. Moderation and simplicity should be practiced, instead of going to extremes. It was never meant, however, that man should live a life of indigence. Jesus promised that all the things necessary for a full and carefree life would be added. He did not say that only part of them would come to the one, who sought first the consciousness of oneness with the creative spirit, but that all necessary things should be added. I have always found that the simplest methods were the most effective in my case. I discovered that words have power to cleanse the consciousness of wrong ideas, and to instill right ideas in their place. Appearances and my feelings told me that I was not paying my way, and that I was not well. Troubles never come singly, so that when I was not feeling well, bad news would arrive and worries would pile up. When I was in one of these black moods, I thought that it was due to my circumstances, instead of which my worrying and depressing circumstances were the result of my depressed moods. I discovered a very simple way of dispersing dark moods. I would take a deep breath and say, health, success, happiness, and joy. I needed health very much, I also needed success in my affairs, and also I longed to be happy and filled with joy. 
When I uttered the words I became lifted up, if only slightly, yet it was a move in the direction of liberation. I found that long arguments did me no good, but repeating these words did lift me up. Needless to say I soon slipped back again into the black, hopeless mood, but again and again I would repeat the performance. I did not say, I am health, or I am success, but simply, health, success. If I had said that I was health when I was unwell, I should have been stating what was not true, if I had claimed to be successful, when obviously I was a failure at the time, I should have been going against the facts, therefore the statements would have been rejected by the inner mind, and the very opposite of what I claimed would have been manifested. But stating the words in the way I did could produce only good results. It kept the ego out of the picture, that is, the false ego of illusion and separateness. It may be thought by some that the words which I used were mere abstractions, and therefore could not be helpful. On the contrary, I found their use very helpful. I found that such words have power. They represent, or stand for, real potencies and powers in the invisible. Consequently if we can but anchor our mind to these substantial realities, powers and principles, then states corresponding to their nature and quality will manifest in our visible life. Some who have attained to God consciousness have done so through repeating the word God. In the East they intone the sacred word OM, or OM. From this it can be seen that if we make use of certain constructive words, words which stand for eternal principles and archetypal ideas, then our mind becomes anchored in that which changes not, and which never decays or becomes old, and which is the eternal pattern or archetype. On looking back, over my life I can see how wisely I have been led by the Spirit. Quite ignorant, and having no one to teach me and no good books to guide me, I was yet led to make the right use of words, and to avoid the evils of affirmation of the, I am, type. What has all this to do with the law of abundance? Everything. As already pointed out, my dark moods were probably not the result of distressing circumstances, but rather the other way about. Assuming this to be true, which I believe to be the case, the use of words in the way I was led to practice was both sound and scientific. If my moods were the cause of the dark experiences, then the practical and scientific thing to do was to cure the mood, after which the circumstances would heal themselves. It may be thought strange that I said nothing about supply or plenty. I was no doubt led to omit all such references, but it seems to me now that it was not necessary to include any reference to supply, for if we can attain to a mental state of health and happiness, and a joyful sense of being on top of things, then all necessary supply and all manner of divine good will naturally follow. It is our moods which have to be overcome, and not our circumstances. If we get our moods right, then circumstances will right themselves. This is why Jesus said that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, after which all necessary things would be added. The effect of acting in the way I did was that in course of time I found myself lifted up on to a higher plane, in a state of oneness with the perfect, and this enabled me to overcome my difficulties. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. That is to say, when we find ourselves one with, and forming part of, the real and perfect, then all our troubles and difficulties become overcome and conquered. They disappear, because they are not anything in themselves, but are simply the result of our lack of, and separation from, the real and perfect. Another baneful emotion which I had to overcome was envy. I had been taught when young that envy was a sin, and that we should not indulge in it, but I never knew that it was a cause of poverty and lack. I had to learn this by experience. When I went to the bank to pay in all I could scrape together, the somewhat meager results of a tremendous amount of work and industry, and also to draw out as little as possible, 
it made me rather envious to see other people paying in much more than I, and drawing out far more than ever I would dream of doing. It not only made me envious, but also mildly resentful. Here was I, working almost till my eyes dropped out, paying in so little and drawing out only a pittance, while other people seemed to be having a much better time, and able to draw out of the bank in one day more than I could pay in a whole month. So I thought how much better it would be, if I could do the same or something very similar. But entertaining envious thoughts is one of the worst possible things for us to do, for it puts us in a negative position. By doing so we acknowledge that our position in life is inferior, thus putting ourselves in a position similar to that of one who asks for alms. So long as we retain this attitude of mind, the things we need and want will tend to flow from us instead of to us. The remedy for this state of affairs is to bless those whose apparently, more fortunate state might otherwise incite us to envy. The cause of our straitened circumstances is our own state of mind. Instead of knowing that all things are ours, and that all the resources of the infinite are behind us, seeking to find expression through us, the dominant thought in our mind is that nothing is ours and that, if we do not chase after things we shall lose them. But if we bless those whose prosperity annoys us or excites our envy, and pray that they may become even more prosperous and blessed in every possible way, then through so doing we heal our own state of mind. When we pray in this way and pour out our blessing upon those who apparently are so much better off than ourselves, we enter the consciousness of one who, possessing all things, pours out of his abundance plenteous gifts upon others. In other words, by blessing others, we ourselves are blessed and all sense of inferiority and lack is overcome. Many a tussle have I had with myself over this. My early training, although so good in most ways, was against me in this respect. My father was forever condemning those who got on in life, he said that such people were hard, ruthless and selfish. But child as I was, I could see that he was envious of the very people he condemned, and also that he was covetous of their prosperity. Now there is nothing more destructive and more calculated to drive supply away from us, than this to condemn and judge harshly those who are better off at the time than we are, at the same time being envious of their prosperity and covetous of their wealth. It is quite clear to me now that if the temptation to envy had been given way to at that time, I should never have overcome my poverty complex, and consequently would never have entered into a state of liberty as regards supply. I have had many talks with men who have come down in life, men who started life with everything in their favor, yet who have let everything slip through their fingers until at last they have had to live on the charity of their children. In every case I have found that they condemned those who had passed them in the race of life, and yet envied them their success and coveted their wealth. They complained that they never had a chance, and that no one ever helped them. Having been brought up in an atmosphere of condemnation and envy, it is not surprising that I experienced difficulty in breaking away from it. But I do not think that I did any condemning although I must confess that I thought that those who appeared to be more fortunate than I were to be envied, and that I would like to be as fortunate as they. This of course was sheer wishful thinking and most weakening. As I have already stated, I found that the remedy was to pray for those who were better off, than myself so that instead of envying them I desired most strongly that they should be blessed and prospered more than ever. Although I prayed in order that they might be blessed, and not myself, the result was that I was wonderfully blessed and that I found myself delivered entirely from an envious spirit, and instead of being an indulger in wishful thinking, I was a dispenser of blessing. Prayer of this character brings us right into our God center, so that it is as though God were speaking benedictions and pouring out blessings upon those for whom we pray. The great secret of liberty therefore is the practice of the presence of God. We can practice the presence as a help in our work and in our spiritual unfoldment, we can also do so as an aid to healing, realizing that we live and move and have our being in the infinite life, 
and that we draw our strength from the one life which never grows old. We can also practice the presence of God as the source of all supply, we can realize that here, with us, is all that we need in its invisible form, in the invisible which surrounds us. As we bless others and pray that their lives may be filled with divine abundance, it becomes possible for blessing to come into our own lives. We do not beg and pray for it, we express it, it flows through us. Of course, I have nothing to say to encourage those who expect things to fall into their lap. I believe in work and plenty of it, and in trying to serve so well that life owes us something. But work alone is not sufficient, the imagination must be reorientated. Neither would I hold out any hopes for those who have made a definite mental demand, expecting it to be demonstrated in a certain form. My experience has been that it is the unexpected which usually happens, and that what we invoke from the invisible very often comes to us in quite a different form from that which we may have outlined. But always God does exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think. The End You have heard my search for truth, volume 3 by Henry Thomas Hamblin, a creation of rich and spiritual.